turn this microphone on? That doesn't matter. Okay. Here, I'm going to... Is that good? Sure. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for... It seems like uh, it's a first for all of us. So this is your first in-person meeting. Uh, and this is my first uh, public talk in, I don't know, a year and a half, two years. <laughs> it's like a really long time. My first public talk as, a, uh, as the county extension agent. Um, so thank you for inviting me. Um, I mean, it's, it's a great space. I've never been to one of your meetings, but I have uh, some friends and then of course, master gardeners that uh, are part of this group. So I should just probably join and start, um, start coming. Um, but today we're, um, tonight we're gonna be talking about making art from the garden. I did uh, present this presentation a couple weeks ago. Uh, with our homegrown series and um, I guess it fit in nicely with uh, with the Native Plant Society and she mentioned my connection with art that's just to say you know I have um, I have that interest in in uh, combining those two things I mean we can learn about plants we can grow plants we can eat them uh, but when it comes to art I mean it just adds a different uh, learning medium everybody learns uh, through like a different language and sometimes you know it's hands-on sometimes it is through art so for me I thought it was really important to um, combine those two things Um, okay, so what we'll cover, uh, just a quick description on why art, um, some dyes, which could be a whole presentation on its own, uh, mono, mono prints, drying and pressing, and then uh, I squeeze in a bunch of my little side projects under other art, uh, just to kind of show that um, you can just make stuff up, you know? You make it up and if you like it, you, you call it art. <laughs> <laughs> that's the way that's the way it goes <laughs> that's it so why art from the garden oops I went the wrong way uh, for me I mean it really comes down to wellness and self-expression uh, you know a lot of times our gardens um, they reflect our lives, our history, our experiences, and then other times it also goes back to the memories of, you know, people that were in our lives, like for me, my mother. And so when we're able to combine these two things, it allows us to take nature inside, but then um, have that keepsake, have that memory as a piece of art inside. So for me, it's, it's just a no-brainer. Um, but there's something really sweet about being able to utilize these things that we love so much and visually in a way that we find so beautiful. Um, and uh, I mean, I think that's important for stress. I think it's important for dealing with grief and you know, even achievements. So hopefully, oops, okay, so dies. All right, so natural dyes go back about 4,000 years to the Middle East uh, uh, and Egypt, uh, but really when the synthetic dyes came about in, uh, I think it was probably in, uh, in the mid-1800s, uh, it just really, it took dyeing to a different level because then um, they were cheaper to make, they were easier to make, they could mass produce it, things, so, uh, what some people might think that a uh, unique aspect of items, uh, it's not really what the manufacturers want. They want to be able to create something that it, uh, there's a hundred things exactly like one another. Uh, but there's always been people that's like, you know what, I don't want something that looks, you know, <laughs> like everything else. So um, there's definitely this, uh, this coming back to dyes and when you use plants with dyeing, there's just no two pieces that will ever be the same. They are so completely unique. So I think that's, um, you know, that's really the, the major draw, especially for, um, you know, for artists and, and people that love plants, you know, we don't, we don't want something that everyone else has. 
And then of course here I have, um, you know, with crafts you can dye a lot of different things. We're going to talk about eggs, um, but then there's fabric and paper. Uh, I need to, I need to get better at using this computer. Okay, so um, this one, dyes either come from like plants, nuts, berries, bark, roots, uh, minerals, even insects. Um, in this case, I just, I really find this um, onion skin uh, picture to be really beautiful, but it's also, um, it's also like a, a good practice to learn how to dye. And we're going to look at um, in a couple slides. So this slide's showing um, these eggs, which I think starting with eggs, I mean, it's just a no-brainer. You have them in your house. Uh, you can eat them afterwards. In this case, uh, we're, they're just using things from the refrigerator. Um, and again, before going to, um, to, to the plants in our yards, uh, this may be easier, you know, using things from our garden and from our refrigerator. Uh, so when you're looking at these colors and all the items that um, created those dyes, does anyone notice like just something that maybe just doesn't match up? Red cabbage. Yeah, isn't that cool? <laughs> so red cabbage dyes blue and they're from um, uh, anthocyanins. So when uh, you create that dye, it turns blue, but any, it, equaling out a little bit of pH helps keep it purple. So evidently, I do not eat cooked red cabbage, but that's why uh, people use a little bit of apple in with it. It changes the pH just enough that the red cabbage stays purple. So na now we're all gonna go home and cook uh, red cabbage. <laughs> It's like, What's people it? cook it? I've always had it in salads. <laughs> I have no idea. Um, so when I did this presentation, it kind of looks like, you know, cascade. Yeah. it says cascade. I, you know, and the first presentation I, I said, okay, you know, uh, can anyone tell me what this is? I got uh, um, hibiscus. I, I think that's too thick for hibiscus. I mean, it doesn't look like a mushroom. I have no idea. That's the mystery of this presentation. Um, so if you, so if, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, if one day all of a sudden you come across it, I mean, uh, certainly email me and then we'll send out a message to everybody. Uh, so, so yeah, that's, that's the one thing. There's no answer. Um, and then, of course, I thought it was really cool, you know, they added the turmeric and the um, red cabbage to make green. These are really vibrant colors, so I have a feeling that, you know, these dyes are really dark. They created them. I found something. It says car cake. It's not cast cake. It's car cake. And it's a drink prepared from the red flowered hibiscus septorifa variety. It's well, now I'm a little sad because there's a little less mystery to my presentation. <laughs> no, that's great. <laughs> you know what? That makes sense because I kept seeing an S right there. Someone else said cascade. And... Oh, nice, nice work. Wow. You guys are impressive. Carcade. I'm going to go we'll look that up tonight. Um, Thank you very much, because that was a, a mystery I'd rather have solved. Um, so with this one, again, going back to starting with eggs, um, and I, I know onions aren't, uh, you know, a, a native, but again, it's really easy to, um, you know, just use these for your practice. Uh, here you see the um, graduation from the light to the dark. Um, you know, in the very top one, they placed boiled eggs in the dye and uh, let it sit for 10 minutes. But the dark one, they actually boiled the eggs in the dye and then still let it sit for 10 minutes because uh, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty dark dye right there. Um, to the right, you can take your plants and place them um, over the eggs and then some pantyhose around just to keep them in place. And then, you know, it's going to dye all around and... Um, and then you get, so this is like egg dye goals for me. 
these are like the prettiest ever. I just think they are so pretty. So yeah, so wherever that plant was, you know, it's not accepting the dye. Um, those are beautiful. So basically, you know, you're going to have to have a pliable plant and you just, you know, form it around and then you um, place like a piece of pantyhose around, tie it, and then that um, keeps it in place. See how th that's the pantyhose around it. Yep. So that's the trick. Oops. I know. <laughs> I know. Or if they sell them, they're probably like $10 or something. It's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, <ice. laughs> um, so the process, there's a lot of different processes, um, you know, but of course we'll talk about some of um, what to use, but like leaves, flowers, lichen, uh, we're definitely not going to get into any insects here. Um, so some of the recipes called a break, breakdown, uh, you know, you could stick it in a blender. Really that's just given more like surface area, you know, for um, the dye to break down into the water. Uh, you boil it to extract that pigment. Um, and you know, and not all things have a pigment that's readily releasable. Um, so that's why some of these things you're able to actually die with because you know they have a pigment in there that works with you. Um, then preparing the um, fabric to absorb that pigment. So that's um, when mordants come in and that's really just um, you can buy fabrics that already have that have already been treated. <coughs> or um, use a homemade recipe. One of them is using like alum and baking soda. And um, basically that just prepares the fabric for uh, not only accepting the dye, but allowing it to stick. So that way, you know, that, that color doesn't fade as quickly. Could you repeat that word? Yeah, M-O-R-D-A-N-T. Okay, that's what I thought you said. Yeah, there's there's a lot of different. I lost my little cursor. Okay, all right. So anyway, then um, you would take that dye, um, soak, uh, soak it. Uh, you know, rinse it out and dry it. Um, a lot of times, uh, whatever dye you use, it is going to fade a bit, and some colors fade more than others. And uh, I think we're going to go over some of that on on these other slides. So this was a really cool uh, resource from the University of Florida that I found. I, I really wished it was in a PDF because I was going to print it off for you guys, but it's a it's a website. And um, afterwards, if uh, if you guys if you would uh, be interested in uh, me sending you some of the links that I used, and then if you send out like a summary, I can do that. Um, but what they did, and, and here's your flower, <laughs> here's the flower of the month. Uh, so this is working from the top, um, then down to the bottom. So basically they just picked um, a bunch of their flowers and um, generally it's gonna take more flowers than you anticipate, you know, to get a strong enough color that you're gonna really be able to see it. And with this particular process, they uh, soaked it in water for 24 hours before they boiled it and uh, created the, the dye, uh, um, strained it with the coffee uh, filter. And then they only soaked that for about 15 minutes. One of them is linen. It looks like the top one's probably linen and the bottom one's cotton. They did not use, they, they made a note that um, there was not a mordant used on it. But the yellow is gonna be a color that, it's probably the best color. <laughs> you know, for dyeing. I mean, it, it, it stays brighter than some of the other colors, um, stays truer. A lot of the reds will kind of fade to um, uh, like a brown. Um, and then even like greens and other colors, um, once, once you're all done, it'll, um, it's still your homemade, you know, dye, but uh, they're just much su settler than, uh, um, is that the right word? subtle they're much more subtle uh, than the synthetic because you know they're just uh, 
nothing's really going to compare to those but that's the whole allure of using uh, plants with dyeing also here are some examples um, so pecans I mean you, you would use the the hall the you know the pe the pecan like the whole thing um, now that can create like a yellow or a brown uh, Spanish moss um, I like the idea of using that because you know <laughs> there's sometimes <laughs> there's just uh, too much of it uh, the wax myrtle I thought was interesting because that can make a couple of different colors and I think that I have that one on the next one uh, Indian blanket again it depends whether you use uh, the you know the flower the um, the greenery the roots but the Indian blanket that can be purple green yellow um, I think even black too I don't know where the black comes from I don't know what part you have to use uh, mulberries that can range from purple brown um, even yellows the basket flower that's the one I'm tempted to do <laughs> uh, so that would be what color do you think the basket color basket flower would and I don't know which part of the flower but what color do you think maybe yeah, no, it's like green and yellow. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think with the yellow, it might be the roots. And uh, then, of course, the coreopsis. I mean, it's all about experimentation, you know? I mean, you can be told that something does something, and I mean, you know, you know the whole Pinterest joke, you know? Pinterest fails. I don't know. I always... My friends are always mad because I don't have Pinterest fails. They always work. Um, <laughs> but... Um, but it, it's that process, you know? I mean, like with something like this, I think uh, not getting the color that we intended would be just as much fun because it's about just the process of making it. And then saying, oh my gosh, I made that. <laughs> um, so here's some more examples. And I did uh, use, I included some things just from the kitchen because again, you can get started really easily. Um, with those onion skins, um, I mean, I started collecting those because I make chicken stock. And so you can throw some of those in to give it a more golden color. Um, but uh, I, I actually never used it for a dye. I, I, should, I should retract that because that's exactly what I did for the chicken stock. <laughs> um, the wax myrtle, yeah, that's like yellow and gray greens. Um, you know, those, those purples, I just think that, um, you know, like the blue and black berries that they probably would, um, they'd probably fade a little bit, you know, like they'll be really subtle. The new one to me was that prickly pear fruit would be peach. I mean, first of all, how many would you need? <laughs> Seems like you would need a lot. Um, but these are some examples. And then, of course, um, when you're harvesting those, um, you know, we don't generally have that many in our own yard, you know, so that would be the other thing is, you know, where, you know, you're not going to come out here and start picking them, you know, mm -hmm. so it's like, okay, or at least, you know, Mexico. not going to tell anyone. No. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So getting beyond uh, dyes, monoprints. So when I did um, my studio art minor, I, was, I went into it um, already having um, had a history of painting with acrylics. I didn't realize I was going to fall in love with um, painting with oils. But then, you know, you have to try all these different things. And I had no idea how much I loved printmaking. And then I went to sculpture, which was very intimidating. And then I realized I loved that. So just be careful getting into art. <laughs> Because trust me, all the supplies I have, I still have somewhere. <laughs> um, so with this printmaking, that left leaf, that was the one that I actually did. Um, so monoprints is uh, using printmaking, and it's always like a one-of-a-kind image. I'm including cyanotypes in with this, even though it's really kind of technically considered photography because you're creating an image of it. Uh, but I reject that. 
because they're all individual too. So in my mind, they're monoprints too. Uh, so with cyanoprints, um, this was discovered in the mid 1800s uh, by Sir somebody Herschel. Um, but he had a friend, Anna Atkins, and she's the one that actually uh, started using uh, cyanotypes with, um, bot for botanical purposes. And then she eventually created uh, a book out of um, the British Isles, uh, um, oh gosh, uh, algae, different algae. Um, so really she's considered to be the first photographer and the first person who created a, a photo book. Um, so another female that has gone under, um, underappreciated and underseen, but um, the, doing the research for this, that was the first time I encountered her. But you know, it's so funny, whenever you um, do research for anything, you always come across some woman that you never heard of before, right? And, uh, but she took this for the botanical purposes um, from her friend. So cyanotypes is really just kind of a blueprinting. So you can either have paper or fabric and there's a light sensitive chemical on it. So essentially you have this light sensitive, say paper, and you have an object on it and then you go outside and uh, you expose it to sunlight. So those UV rays interact with those chemicals. And um, when it's out in the sunlight, what you see is blue turns white, uh, but then when you go inside and stop the process and rinse it in water, it actually reverses and what was white is now that um, really dark blue. So with these, what works best are, um, are items that have more um, texture because you know like photographs, they're going off that positive space and this is going strictly off that negative space. So I think with the ferns, that's probably, um, probably the best thing in my mind uh, that you can use on one of these. Uh, but, you know, there's so many other items. Um, but for example, like if you saw a shell and you thought, oh, this is really cool, I wanna do this. I mean, it's gonna be a dud because it's just gonna be a really dark white spot on your paper. Um, but like with that fern, you can even see uh, some of the, um, tones in there where maybe the leaf is a little thicker on the edges compared to inside. Uh, but these flowers down here show it really well. That center is really thick, the, the stem, so it, um, it, let, it let less UV light through, so that ended up white. But then all those petals, uh, you know, even you can even see where it's overlapping. See where the petals are overlapping right here? and um, there's less UV light able to get in there. So that's what creates the image. What about the red? I don't, you know what, and, and I put that in there and I was just gonna say, I don't even know how that turned red. Like I just pulled that image. <laughs> so, I, you know, I have a feeling, um, I, I have some theories, but I don't, I don't know why it's red. Um, the reason why I like that photo though is because it did, even though that is cyanotypes uh, or, you know, a sh you know, just a kid friendly um, term is sun printing, but that reminded me of the botanical prints. And, you know, if any of you are on Instagram or um, probably even Etsy probably has it, but, um, on Instagram, there's a lot of artists now that are doing these botanical prints, and that's not something I'm covering. Uh, but really, uh, they take leaves and flowers, and they put it on a prepared cloth, and they roll it up and let it soak, and then um, that impression and those colors are transferred. So that's what that reminded me of. So I put that up there so I'd remember to, to bring that up to you. Um, once you start looking that stuff up on Instagram, then they know you looked for it and it keeps coming up in your searches. <laughs> and then that's another rabbit hole. It's not good. So the one on the right, that's the one that I made. So by looking at that, um, I, 
it was it was quite a while ago. I was like, you know, that's got to be a red bud. <laughs> um, so I don't know. I mean, how many of you are familiar with printmaking, like other than just looking at it? Yeah. So I mean, some. Um, I mean, if you if you're at all familiar with it, sometimes people think of like wood cuts or lino cuts, where you know you uh, have to. Um, carved down into the surface or intaglio that you, you probably seen intaglio and, and didn't even know it that's probably the least fun thing that i did in all the art projects because that's um, etching down into uh, a metal plate and there's a lot of processes um, but with monotypes i mean they're just so darn easy because you're not etching into anything and you're just uh you're just manipulating the surface. And uh, with this, I can't even remember exactly how I did it. Uh, I know I used some kind of glass. I brought some materials um, just to give you a quick idea of how easy it is. So for this talk, I, you know, all those supplies that I have, I don't know where they are. So I went and bought a brayer. I went and bought some, a tube of printmaking ink. I, I bought a, surface so what did I do I left it at work today so I was like well I don't have it right and I thought well that stinks but I think the biggest thing that I've learned from art is actually problem solving especially like when you with anything but especially like uh, printmaking and sculpture and I thought you know what I'm not gonna let the fact that I left those things because then that's like an, that I don't want to say an excuse that's one of the reasons we all have right I don't really know how to do it no I don't have everything I need and then we procrastinate until we never do it right so I thought you know what I, I like that lesson better than being prepared and bringing those things seriously mm -hmm. so at home I just found what I could and um, I'm just gonna kind of show how easy it is I did prepare one thing. I just took some paint over like a, a cardstock. And I found some maple leaves. I did do a practice with a uh, coleus. I'm sorry, but the veination is like just so, so great for this. And that was something we talked about um, too with these um, on my last presentation that I think when we're, um, when we play with this type of process too, it does allow us to not only investigate and, and explore the art side of it, but there's, um, there's that scientific side too, because there is veination and we want to use uh, leaves that have that texture that, um, you know, if, if it's real super flat, like on the top side of a leaf, like I would never use the top side, you would want to use the underside. So that gives us an opportunity to explore, um, you know, intimately those leaves. But, um, so, okay, so I am just going to, I tried to prepare this a little bit. And there's a lot of different um, ways that you can do this, but this is probably the most um, simple as we're all here together. And so if you were gonna, if you gave this project to a kid, you, you probably have at some point, you know, they're gonna really, um, they're gonna really apply too much paint to that leaf so the trick here is not to apply too much so that's what we see the sponge so I and I mean it's not going to be pretty but you're going to see what I mean right so we're just going to go with it my hands were already blue from practicing this so you just really want to sponge it on you don't want too much because then you're not going to um, you're not going to get that detail that you want and like I said, this is just one way. And you want to be sure to go down and get that stem too, because that also is really going to play into that final product. Um, I mean, having a leaf is great, but having that. So I'm just tapping, blotting it on. And in my 
uh, just trying to figure things out, I was afraid that the acrylic would um, would dry too quickly, but it really didn't. So this is where I would have used the brayer. But uh, with this ma maple leaf, uh, I'm able to just do it with my hands. So a brayer, oh, I took that, I took that photo out. Yeah, so it's a roller. It's like, um, you know, like this big, and it just has a short handle. And it just lets you just really smash things down, you know, like that. Um, if you have a leaf, say like a kale, um, where you have that really super thick stem, I mean, it's just not gonna work. It's too, it's too thick. So you have to really um, just, you know, experiment with the different types of leaves, but usually that underside. Let's see if this acrylic dried. See, that dried too much. So I'm going to put more on because I'm not going to let you walk away and be like, I didn't even see anything. <laughs> What's that? Well, um, so I bought, uh, I went to, well, you can buy, you can buy printmaking ink anywhere and that's what you would want to use. Um, but because I left it at work, <laughs> Uh, I had acrylic and so I just used this at home uh, before I came here and it did work with the coleus so you know maybe it's just the um, but this one is bigger than that coleus too so that's why I'm trying to work really quickly uh, because and yeah, yeah, it's a smaller tube. Um, they're going to be more, a little bit more pricey, um, but yeah, and then you can uh, you can mix them, you know, and create your own colors. Just it's just sometimes that acrylic can dry. That's why I really liked oil painting. I mean, there's pros and cons for everything, but that oil really um, really stays wet a lot longer. All right, so if this doesn't work, I don't even know. Oh yeah, that's a little better. So, so I mean, you can see, you can really make something that um, is really beautiful, <laughs> you know? And uh, it just takes a little bit of practice, but I mean, it's, I mean, it's not a whole lot, but you can just I mean, but it got, it got all those details. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah, very much so. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, and you can see even down here where the stem is, what I was starting to talk about. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, you know, you can really, that stem can get too thick and then you're gonna have a huge big white space beside that stem. Mm -hmm. I mean, I haven't used flowers with this, but uh, you know, I started thinking about Turk's cap, and I was like, you know, I bet that that might that might print kind of nicely. All right, I am. Um, I need to make sure I'm staying on. We're good. Okay, drying and pressing. So why dry or press? I mean, really, you're just able to take that beautiful thing from your yard and bring it inside and then keep it forever and ever and ever. Um, <laughs> or is that just me? I just keep them forever. My husband's like, how many dried flowers can we have? I don't, that's what we're trying to find out. <laughs> how many? Um, it's inexpensive, in, inexpensive. It uses things that you already have. Um, one thing I always do is, I mean, it sounds really weird, and, and I did it this last time, but um, when both of my parents passed, I don't know what it is. It's like, um, you know, like when a dog comes to the door, like when you go to visit, and then a dog's looking around for its, you know, toy to give you. Every time something happens to someone, I actually look around for the first flower, and I press it. And I have the one from my dad that was 20 years ago. So when this happened with my mom, it was happening so quickly and my husband was just trying to get me out the door um, on a plane. And I'm just like, I'm looking around. I go, he goes, yes, I'll get it. I'm like, 
I need to see that you actually pressed it. And he's like, okay. So it, it's just so weird. We all have our thing and that's my thing. If someone passes away, I have to find a flower to press. Um, for me, I just like looking at it and it's like, that's something that was alive, you know, when, when that person was alive. So, you know, we do this, you know, all for different reasons. But um, drying flowers goes back a long time too, um, probably just as long as dying. I think the British, there's a British museum that has a dried laurel head wreath that is Guess how old it is? Do I have any guesses? How old this dried laurel head wreath is? It is 2,000 years old. It's like, so I told my husband that. <laughs> he, he was very sad. <laughs> he was like, oh no, no. <laughs> It's like, we don't have to ever get rid of these. Um, I'm not going into all the other different ways, but you know, there's air drying, the pressing. Um, to this day, when I, I th probably last year, I threw away a, one of those really old telephone books. I felt so guilty because my mom always taught me, oh, that's what we pressed everything in. We pressed everything in it. So I, I recycled it and I'm just like, oh, it just seems so wrong. This is like a perfect press. Microwaving and using those desiccants, they can really retain the colors better. I just haven't really gone that route um, with the pressing. Even with the pressing, um, I'm a big fan of um, uh, a moonflower vine and it's way too thin so you know when you're pressing you have to just uh, you know figure out you know what works what doesn't now that maple leaf that may have retained a lot of its color uh, so this is looking at um, taking inspiration from herbariums and uh, how a lot, I've seen a lot of art online that really have that core component of that scientific research. Um, you know, like this one on the left, I mean, you can either use the plant, the flower, going down into the root, depending on how, um, how big that is with your paper. And then you can make notes, uh, you know, what it is, where you found it. Uh, slap a frame on it and it looks like a piece of artwork um, but it's also like a little journal of yourself too because you did that you know uh, you know that I saved all the flowers that my mom pressed so um, you know again we all have our own reasons but um, they're usually really oh I want to go back so the, the image on the right, I just wanted to show, I'm a thrower in, I just throw it in and press it. Um, but you know, when you have a, a plant like this, you can manipulate it and get it to dry in a certain composition, especially if you know what size that you want to put it in. Um, you just, you know, take a little piece of tape. And I really like the idea of using the roots, but again, you know, that just depends on the specific plant and then uh, how much space you have. Some examples of pressed flowers that would work, uh, definitely Rudbeckia, Coreopsis, um, Salvia, uh, Echinacea could probably work, but you know, when you get to um, plants that have like a really thick center, uh, for me, they always mold. I mean, it can, you can press them. You just have to be patient. You have to have materials that's gonna wick that moisture away. Um, but stick with thinner items, or if you have a really thick uh, flower, you can just take those petals off around it, dry those, and then you have the impression of that flower. Seed heads, I'm not talking about pressing those. <laughs> That's like, you know, like drying. So all of these, um, you know, you could probably dry too. So yeah, the yellows and oranges are gonna keep better. The red's okay, and, but um, all the other colors, light colors, they're gonna tend to fade, so. It's just some, an expectation that you have to have when you go into it. Um, again, I think a really nice one to press would be Turk's cap because when you press hibiscus, you know that pistol, oh look, I didn't know my finger was all painted. Um, <laughs> I was 
like, what, what is that? Um, <laughs> You know, that pistol is uh, pressed up against the pedal, but with that Turk's cap, uh, you know, it comes up above. Oh, I think it's going to be perfect. You know what I'm going to be doing. So pressing and, um, and then even this, uh, you know, the sun printing would be really cool with that one. And then uh, one of them that I uh, did when I worked at the short, short time, like six months um, at the extension at Bear Creek before it flooded was um, the Dutchman's pipe vine. Uh, those are so th that work too. Those are really cool. Can you give me an idea yeah. how long you have to press it before it's, it? It means like a, a month or ten months or. No, it just depends. I mean, if you have you know something really thin, I mean, it could be. I don't know because like I tend to just leave it for like a really long time. <laughs> So, I mean, I, I would probably do it for at least a couple months just to make sure that it's, you know, really dry. But if it's a thicker one, you know, you're just going to have to check it. And maybe um, if you have uh, paper on either side of it, you may have to, you know, change those out, you know, if, uh, you know, depending on the amount of moisture that's being absorbed. I've got a little experience with that. I, for thin things, small and thin, as little as a week, hmm. press between watercolor paper hmm. for absorption. You also get a nice print of it potentially, hmm. uh, or even just printer paper. You know, white printer paper, mm -hmm. cardboard. Um, I use a small press, so I actually use large binder clips that hold the cardboard in place. And I just date it. I date the cardboard, and usually in about a week. Mm -hmm. I just wonder what's the humidity, but of course, if you have it in your house where you have air conditioning, it, it yeah, it tends to work pretty. It tends to work pretty okay in the house. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Again, you want to change the paper out after you've done it, probably once. You know, I I change the paper. I don't change the cardboard. Mm -hmm. It's just the corrugated you get. You know, a little thicker mm -hmm. than the boxes. Thanks. Yeah. She's up on her pressing. I do not follow up <laughs> at all. Um, I even make a, um, a sham board from black raspberries. That can be done in a lot less time. I always take 12 months. I just leave it somewhere and forget about it. <laughs> Strain it a year later, tastes just as good. Um, the other one that I thought would be really good with pressing and even the cyanotypes would be the fringe tree. I think that would create, especially with the cyanotypes. All right, I think I need to keep going. So here's an example of a press that you can make. There's a lot that, you know, there's many of them that you can buy. Um, I had these really large leaves, so I ended up having my husband build me one that was like about this big. <laughs> and um, what's that? Okay. I forgot how much time. Okay. Um, we're right, I think close to the end. Um, so here th it shows uh, the, the wood and then the cardboard that she talked about and then, um, you know, the paper. Uh, this is just an example of like what we talked about, you know, doing something that looks like a specimen and then using your handwriting or your notes and, you know, that's your own personal piece of artwork. On the right side, um, that's just a stress um, that repetition can really come into play. So, you know, where you like one leaf, but if you have, you know, 20 of them, uh, it can really make more of an impact. It's kind of like, you know, in landscaping where, you know, yeah, you can have one or two plants. It's going to look really weird. Uh, but, you know, if you do five, seven or 13, you know, it, it's going to create more of an impact. And then other art. So this is just, they're all gonna be different. Uh, there is pounding. Um, I believe this came from a paper someone did in the 1960s. Uh, so this was his scientific research, but I thought there was just so much artistic um, potential there. Uh, it's from the 1960s and look at that Coreopsis. It, you can still see the yellow on it. And that's probably like on a really thin, um, piece of fabric. So with that, um, you are going to um, pound with a hammer. So, 
you know, you'll um, have a protection down, you'll have uh, the fabric, then you put the plant and then you have something over it. And I've never done it really well, so I just abandon it. Um, but uh, you can hammer it. Um, what's that? Yeah, or yeah, but sometimes you need a real hammer too, depending on what it is. Um, so I think with this one, it really takes practice, you know, to be able to have that, just the right um, heaviness to it. And I think the best thing um, that turns out with pounding is like a Japanese maple, just, just that red color. Just unfortunately, we don't have them. Yeah, um, I've got a little bit of experience with pounding. It turns out you do need quite, quite a bit of force on it, and it has to be pretty even. Mm -hmm. So if you're thinking about it, no, as if, if you're thinking about it, you have to, and you have to come down, not across, because mm -hmm. you're trying not to move it. Yeah. You know what I'm thinking? So if you're thinking about pounding a hammer and you're going, uh, pounding a nail and you're going one, two, you know, with the same force, because otherwise you end up with a very uneven print. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, it is, you're right, it, it's kind of a, Hit or miss, yeah. pun intended. It is, it is kind of a, one of those where uh, sometimes flowers work pretty well. And then uh, if there's thin. Do you leave the flower in there or is that just the... No, you, you, you take the flower out and what you're doing is you're pounding that pigment directly oh, onto that cloth. Mm -hmm. the flower and then you take the flower off. Yeah, yeah and you remember you remove the rest of the, of the bits of things. Mm -hmm. Now, I also will tell you I've never tried washing it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so this is an elephant ear. Um, this was a high fire porce white porcelain, uh, but you can uh, buy, uh, you know, air dry. I'm not a big fan of air dry. I think it's too weak. Um, but there's other types of um, pottery that you can use that is you can easily use um, at home. Uh, wreaths. This was a wreath I made of all found materials. Um, the only thing I didn't find, there's eucalyptus in there. I gave a friend a eucalyptus in Virginia. She had it for like 20 years, then it came down in a storm. It was, it was like 20 feet tall too, and she mailed me an entire box. Those are the kind of friends I have. They just, <laughs> they mail me entire boxes of like euca eucalyptus leaves. And then the bittersweet, that was local, but I bought it. So those are the only two things that were acquired. Everything else I found. Um, so that's another, um, you know, that's another way to, um, to create something from, from our nature we love. This cannot be done with native plant, or it might be able to, but this was not. Um, this was something when I was preparing for the presentation that I gave um, a few weeks ago. Uh, I used, I mean, if you have a garden uh, or from the grocery store. So my husband walked in about eight o'clock at night and saw all these vegetables made as flowers. And, and he walked in, he goes, oh, you're doing this. Okay, walked right back out. <laughs> He was like, boy, when you put your mind to something. Um, so, I mean, we've seen this. If, you're, if you've been online, you've seen um, making focaccia. But, you know, hey, making art is what, you know, whatever's in front of me, I'm going to try to make something from it. And just consider this ephemeral because it's all eaten. Yeah, so what I determined was those peppers I could have cut thicker because they dried really thin. Um, Inside the, um, the flower going up on the right, that had basil in it. Uh, the onions really dried nicely. Um, the basil on, as like the, the landscape, that dried nicely too. But um, yeah, it's just all about playing around. You oh, I ate it, totally. <laughs> <laughs> My gosh, it was, it was so good. There's none left. Um, there were olives in there too. Yeah, those were the center. So that those are really good to use too. Um, 
but I kind of had a wax paper and I did like my mock-up and then it was like 8.30 and I'm like, whatever, you know. <laughs> Uh, okay, so this is um, some of these projects. I had a friend um, that's in Virginia, so we were challenging each other to do um, one art project every week. That was a lot. Um, so this was a stink bug, a picture that I took. Yeah, five minutes. Okay, a stink bug picture. I think this is about this big. Um, so I took the photo of the stink bug and then I uh, blew it up, put it on cardstock. And then I had been going for a lot of wildflower walks. So um, everything on there except for the, um, you know, the black dots were uh, made up of some kind of wild uh, flower or wildflower leaf going along on my walk. So, I mean, I mean, you literally can just make it up. You just make up whatever and you do it. And then you're like, I made this, you know, it feels so good. Um, this was the last one. Um, so these are banana plants. So um, I created envelopes out of banana plants. And each of the envelopes were, um, I inscribed the name of the person who had passed in my life. So, you know, I had about six of them. And then um, using all the leftovers, you know, I created, uh, you know, there's the the design on the front and then I had these leftovers that were perfect for a butterfly so I, I just put that together and then I was like wow that's perfect um, and then it then it dried up and you throw it away that's why you take the pictures take the pictures and you keep that forever on your cell phone it's until your cell phone doesn't work anymore because you have too many pictures on it <laughs> <laughs> am I the only one <laughs> All right, so we're going to do our quick quiz. Um, natural, go, natural dyes go back at least how far? 4,000 years. Uh, who is known as the first female photographer? I know, she had a big dress, didn't she? An acronym. Anna Atkins, yeah. Uh, I didn't talk about this with you guys, but um, what is the best drying method for roses? So if you think about roses and how they're not flat and they are thicker, so of those four different methods that we looked at, like what might be the better option for like a thicker flower like that? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Red cabbage creates what color dye? Yep. And, okay, so of all the things that you saw, what are some things that you would like to try? Pounding. Pounding. Yeah, <laughs> that's, you're stressed out, aren't you? <laughs> she said that too quickly. What else? What do you think? Pressing. Pressing, yeah. Is anyone really tempted to do the dyeing? I mean, oh, yeah. I see us like, you know, let's touch and base. Let's touch base. Let's see what, what's happened. What did we go and do? <laughs> I've had bags of onion skin sitting around waiting yeah. for me to do something crazy. Yeah. Put them in, put them in my soup stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about cloth napkins. You know, I was thinking, what could be yeah. small that I could dye mm -hmm. that, you know, wouldn't be like fabric for an outfit or something. But yeah. Yeah, you know, even with that, like you can um, go to the craft store and get small pieces, cut them like this big. And if you have something like, um, you know, like what we passed around, I mean, you can use the multimedia. So you can take that yellow Coreopsis little patch and maybe you do the leaf print on top of it, or maybe you do it behind, you know, at, at the bottom and you create something, um, you know, with more than one process. Yeah, yeah, but cut your peppers thicker. Yeah, anybody else? Well, that doesn't surprise me. No. I don't think I got a Christmas card from you this year, did I? I 
All right, anybody else? <laughs> Any, anything else that you saw that you're like, I don't know, that's, that's kind of cool. So it just goes back to, um, I mean, it feels good. You know, I mean, we already have this passion for plants and it's like to be able to create something like this. Um, don't, I think it's by the age of eight, uh, kids stop uh, creating art spontaneously. And that's when they start becoming really self-aware. And then you, you, you know, you, you get in our shoes now as an adult and we think, no, I don't want to create something unless I know it's going to be right or that it's going to, I'm going to succeed at it. And there's those expectations. And like with art, you just have to throw that away. Who cares? Who cares if it's right, you know? Are we all done? Oh, oh, I want to add something real quick. I'm sorry. Um, oh, these are the key elements. But I didn't, I didn't have anything for us to be able to do, um, but that's coming. With AgriLife, um, there's this lifescaping series. And there's going to be a series of things that um, a bunch of us within Extension are going to do. My part is I'm actually going to do a hands-on workshop. And what I'm thinking about is combining some of the things I talked about, but maybe focusing on um, like, a, um, like one of those specimen plants. And um, so it's literally we're brainstorming right now. I know it's going to be October. Uh, there's probably going to be a limit of maybe 20 to 30 people, so you might want to look for that. And where do we look for that? Uh, with AgriLife Extension, um, yeah, and uh, we have a Facebook page, the Harris County Horticulture. Uh, we'll probably put it out with the Harris County Master Gardeners also. Um, or for Master no, no, no. This will be for the public. Yep. So like uh, Paul Winsky, the, um, the other horticulture agent, he's going to do a combination pot. Um, someone else may do a, a cooking one. So, so any other questions? This is I know. Very entertaining. Thank you. Thank oh. You very much. <laughs> yeah, thank you.